Since 1998, Intel and Red Hat have been collaborating closely to build proven solutions on open architectures. This collaboration delivers platforms that can respond to large mission-critical challenges. Running Red Hat on Intel processors, Linux has continually delivered increasing levels of performance as well as enterprise-class robustness. Now, please welcome Pauline Nist, General Manager for Enterprise Software Strategy at Intel, to the 2012 Red Hat Summit. Intel is truly happy to be back at the Red Hat Summit. Um, we're always thrilled to see this many software people this early in the morning. Um, I know that that's always a challenge the further you get into the week. And what we want to do is spend some time talking about the work we're doing with Red Hat, um, our support for the whole open source movement in general, and how Intel technology is going to provide the foundation that lets us continue to grow and exploit the changes that are happening in the industry. The first thing I want to say, though, is that we are thrilled, absolutely thrilled, to congratulate our friends and partners at Red Hat on crossing the $1 billion of revenue mark. That is a huge accomplishment for an open source company. It's something that numerous people, I'm sure, thought could never be done. We were at Intel, um, not many people know, an early investor in Red Hat. And what I can say to you today with total certainty is we sold too soon. <laughs> but what I want to do is uh, call Paul Cormier up here. Um, we've got a small token of uh, our appreciation. Now, the corporate people made sure that I would come up here and give you this wonderful plaque which celebrates the 10 years of Intel and Red Hat working together oh, thank you. and the success you guys have had. Thank so we'll do the photo well. op. But this, this is the really important part. For the, in, uh, for the Red Hat employees and people who live in the local area, Red Hat is up in Westford. And in Westford, there is a legendary ice cream stand called Kimball's. And what we've got for you here is gift certificates for everybody at the Westford site to go to Kimball's and have ice cream on Intel. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Pauline. And I'm certain our local partner manager will manage to be in Westford that day. So, where do we go from here? Um, I was laughing last night because I've sat through all of the keynotes to date. And if I'm right, I think this is the fifth big data slide you've seen so far. So obviously, big data is a topic that's on everybody's mind. We put it up here for a reason that's a little bit different. We're all aware of the consumer side of big data, whether it's tweeting or Facebook or cell phones or retail, all of the things that we interact with. Intel wants to talk about it because of the top line, which is sense data. And you're starting to hear more and more about that from the various partners that have been up here talking. About 10 months ago, we actually pulled the Intel Embedded Computing Group into the server organization. Because one of the things we realized was that embedded solutions were really driving the amount of sense data that was being produced and that it was growing exponentially. Excuse me for a minute. We have been in the embedded business for a lot of years, but what we're now seeing is just an explosion, literally, in everything from RFID tags on FedEx and UPS boxes to Walmart inventory. We're seeing in-vehicle entertainment systems that are going to connect every car in the future to the internet live. We're seeing all of you walk around with cell phones that are part of what the retail establishment is trying to use GPS tracking to connect with you on. But more importantly, there's a production aspect on the sense data side. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more. There are 30 million network sensors today and they're growing at about 30% a year. About two years ago, I went to one of our customer advisory boards and ran a breakout session on business information and analytics. 
And I expected to hear pretty typical stuff about retail health care, the places that we all see it. What I was totally taken aback by was the manufacturing side of the house. That in general, virtually every manufacturer out there is looking to totally instrument production lines. Literally to monitor the specs of the equipment that's running them and the materials that's going through them, the quality of the products coming off of them, and to start doing it in real time. Now when you think about the fact that not only are there 30 million sensors growing at 30 percent, but that many of them now want a real-time feedback loop to get information into the compute environment and to get instructions back out of again. The amount of data that that's generating, whether it's coming from oil wells or production lines, is truly amazing. I will give you an Intel example. Every fabrication factory we have is totally instrumented. In the first place, fabs are nothing but huge chem labs. And you obviously want to make sure that every piece of equipment is within spec for the yield of the product and the success and the quality of the product, but also because it can get very dangerous if in one of these huge chemistry labs something goes out of spec. But not only today do we, we instrument the entire production line and have constant, continuous, real-time feedback to keep those lines in specification so we maximize their production, we now also feed that data totally through all of our ERP systems because it's the product cost, it's the product availability, it gives us the ability to respond to new requirements or orders from our OEM partners on a much shorter period of time. And we're just a microcosm of everyone else in the industry who's doing that. I've talked to oil people who have now instrumented every well they have. They, they can manage the drill bit equipment more accurately, but if they can keep a well in the ground two or three days or a week longer than they normally did, they can pay for any computers they can buy to do that. So as you see this whole machine-generated feedback loop moving through the computing environment, generating requirements for computes, and then in the end game, connecting also with smart users and smartphones, you can see that every step of the battle is going to contribute more data, demand more computes, more storage. It's why you're seeing a lot of interest in companies like Intel and Red Hat to look not just at the computes, but to look at the network and to look at the storage environment to say, how do we scale this together? Now, the last piece of big data is, of course, do you have to worry about it? How do you make it work for you? And I think a lot of people who are outside maybe some of these areas are saying, well, I've got some time to think about this. Big data isn't something that's really influencing me today. We think that the embedded computer market, the sensor-driven data, the production data, is going to be one of the first places that really drives this move. I mean, we all know there's a lot going on in social networking and Facebook and Twitter, but does your company really pay attention to that? Is that really driving what you get up in the morning and have to worry about? We think that the production and the embedded stuff is going to hit everybody first as a wave of something that they have to deal with. The amount of data that enterprises have to ingest is predicted to grow 50 times by 2020. Not 50%. 50 times. Now we've got a few years to figure out how to scale that, how to manage it, how to deal with it, and more importantly, how to filter it and process it. Because the best guesses of the portion of that data that are going to be truly useful to you is about 10%. And the rest of it is going to be exhaust. And that's the other part of the challenge. How do you separate out of that mass of data the data that you really need to make you be more competitive? Because if all of your competitors are utilizing this data to streamline their operations, uh, manage their equipment, manage their order rates, manage their product quality, your IT organization is going to need to do that to give your environment the best information it can for making decisions. I don't think there's anybody in this room who thinks that their IT budget is going to go up 50 times, right? So <laughs> that is why we're all here, because we all absolutely believe that open source, open standards for hardware, open source software, parallelization, solutions like Gluster are going to be key to getting the scale, the performance, and the price point for that IT environment. It's one of the reasons Intel's investing, and we're going to talk a little bit about what we're doing to make sure that Moore's Law continues to deliver to you the kind of performance at the price points that you're used to. 
Business as usual is not going to be an option. As you need to transform your IT infrastructure to deal with the changes that are coming, we're all having to worry about a lot more, and you're hearing that here this week. Intel, of course, continues to drive innovation in silicon at the bottom of the pile here. That's what we do. We want to make sure that you have industry standard hardware, that it's scalable, that it's secure, that it gives you the cycles you need. We have worked with people like Facebook on the Open Compute Project, not because we think the industry is going to flip over to one design that comes out of Facebook, but because the internet data centers are very frequently a leading edge. You've heard people from uh, Red Hat talk about the fact that they work with a lot of them because we learn from them. These guys aren't deploying tens of thousands of machines, they're deploying hundreds of thousands of machines. And what we can learn from them in terms of scalability, in terms of heating, cooling, software utilization, system management, virtualization, is going to prepare all of us to take that and transform it into something that is very broadly applicable to people who are only running hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of machines in data centers where they still have to worry about power, cooling, heating, software management, automation. It's one of the reasons that we are very, very committed to the open source software environment because we believe that that's the only environment that is going to continue to deliver very quick innovation and evolution. If you look at some of the things that have come out of the Apache Foundation and Hadoop in terms of dealing with big data, if you look at what people like Red Hat have done, not just with, with enterprise Linux, but with virtualization, with the cloud work they're doing, with the storage work they're doing, that's going to be key to providing the top, which is an elastic infrastructure of services across both compute and storage and the network. Um, you're going to hear, and I think you've heard a couple of people say here about an evolving thing called software-defined networks because we believe that just as the compute side and the storage side have to scale and need management tools, that networking has got to evolve from where it is today to a much more flexible, expandable, manageable, transparent resource that is available to help scale these elastic services. Now let's talk a little bit about Intel's investment, and I'm uh, going to go a little bit backwards because um, we are breaking some new ground. As you would expect, we've traditionally invested an enormous amount in manufacturing leadership, and I've got a couple of special slides that are going to tell you what we're doing with uh, fabrication technology and manufacturing technology to let us keep producing parts. Obviously, we've always invested in systems architecture. But today, just like Red Hat, we're broadening what we mean by a system. For a long time, a system to us was the CPU, maybe the memory, um, maybe some links and interconnect. But today, just like everyone else, we have to worry about the networking technology and the storage technology. We're investing a huge amount in solid state devices for storage because they are key to being able to provide the kind of I.O. rates that we believe people need to scale with the CPUs and this big data demand. We're also investing on the network side. We've spent the fast, past year acquiring um, technical resources in the fabric and the switching space from Fulcrum, some assets from Cray, some InfiniBand assets. And I think one of the things you will see from Intel in the future is that it's going to take a stronger role in how not only you pack hundreds of these CPUs into a rack, but how you interconnect them both within the rack and then to the outside world to deliver more performance. Obviously, we made a major investment in security with the acquisition of McAfee. Uh, it's actually kind of interesting because following the McAfee acquisition, Intel's software assets alone show up as probably one of the top 10 software companies in the world. Um, be besides the McAfee and the Wind River assets that we've got, we continue to have major, major investments in things like compiler technology that delivers the performance of our chips. And in working with partners like Red Hat, we are also one of the key contributors to the Linux kernel. And we'll continue to make that investment to ensure that features and capabilities that are in our chips are turned on in a timely fashion and available to enable open source to compete with the other software stacks that are out there. And then last but not least, we spend more and more time with this global ecosystem. 
And I'm gonna go into a little bit of detail because it shows why Red Hat and the rest of the open systems world is very, very important to us, along with other ISVs, many of whom were here this week, to ensure that not only are we delivering the base system capability, but targeted solutions that come from partners like SAS and SAP and IBM and even Oracle that can run on these boxes. So Intel, like Red Hat, has a long history here of enabling open source solutions. We tend to focus on how we can connect features that are in the underlying hardware and pull them up into the kernel so that then they can be utilized there and in all the software layers that are above. So in areas like virtualization, we have implemented uh, features in the silicon that have allowed us to triple the performance in three years. I was here last year and I spent a considerable amount of time talking about the work that we're doing with Red Hat in mission critical deployments. It's actually gotten to be such a steady state operation now that we really don't think about it because between the software we've, or the hardware we've delivered with enhanced features like our machine check architecture, our RAS capability, our error correcting codes, we then partner with Red Hat to deliver a Linux mission critical environment on our four socket systems that allows us to go over after any Unix workload out there. So together we are doing a great job of converting risk Unix mission critical workloads that two, three, four years ago people would never have considered running on Linux. And now we are past the convince you stage. We are at the how do we help you make the transition stage, which is a great place to be. And we thank our partners at Red Hat for helping us get there because every day, every week, and every geography around the world, we have got joint programs that are helping get more and more applications into the open systems Linux environment. We have implemented cryptography instructions in the base hardware. And what, what the cryptography in the hardware lets you do is literally accelerate crypto all the way up through the stack without paying a performance penalty. Because the minute that you have instructions that implement cryptography, it's not a software issue, it's you just let the hardware do it. And I personally, having had personal data of mine compromised by any number of vendors out there since it happens just about once every quarter, um, would like to see it become a standard, would like to see that there isn't an unencrypted laptop. Intel forces all employees to encrypt every piece of data on their laptop. And I think it should be done in every financial institution, in every brokerage institution, in every credit card company, in every healthcare institution. There should not be unencrypted data out there. Um, we've also invested on the storage and the networking side in our non-volatile RAM technology. We continue to deliver uh, better, bigger, faster SSDs because we see that as people deal with this data, um, they're really replacing what was the tier of high performance hard drives with solid state devices. I have a solid state device in my laptop and what I have to say to you is if you don't have one, get one because you will never go back. You will never go back to rotating media once you get used to the performance and the reliability that you get from solid state because it's not a mechanical device. So you can see that write speeds have fed up, 10 gig ethernet is driving faster connections in and out of these machines, uh, 40 gig ethernet is on the horizon, so we're gonna continue to see progress there. And as you've heard from HP and others, we're also very invested in trusted compute pools. We're working very closely with the OpenStack organization and implementing features like our trusted execution technology um, to allow for clouds and virtualization to be more secure. Intel also has done an enormous amount of work with this whole ecosystem. You know us here for the work we do with Red Hat, but we've partnered with Red Hat and others like IBM and the Open Virtualization Alliance. We have supported the Open Data Center Alliance, which is an alliance of customers trying to do use cases and standards for deploying open solutions in the future so that all of the functionality that people need is available in a totally open stack, not just in proprietary solutions. And we also make investments in smaller companies in the Linux world through our Intel Capital Arm because we want to see the ecosystem continue to expand and grow. So just as we did that early on with Red Hat, we continue to look for players today, whether they're in the big data space or the OpenStack world, um, to be able to help us continue to make sure that this technology um, is fostered and expands. 
Now, I'm from a chip company, so I'm going to take a little bit of time to tell you about the latest systems that we're selling today. Um, we have two major Xeon chips that we think are pumping the heart of the open data center and the big data environment. On the left-hand side, I think it's the left-hand side, yep, is our E7 processor family. Our E7 processor family is the top of the line for Xeon chips. If you want the maximum number of cores, the fastest performance parts, the most memory on a system, all of the RAS features for our machine check architecture and our other error correcting capabilities, um, that's the processor that we've sold. That tends to be the processor in its four socket configuration that we do a lot of work with Red Hat in moving these risk Unix migrations over to the Xeon family. It's got the highest enterprise and database performance. In fact, um, we published some world record performance um, with two of our big database partners on both the four socket and the eight socket systems this year. So we've now got leadership uh, results in, in the traditional TPCC world. And I think across the board, E7 has got 25 world record performance results. And I think the fine print down there tells you, based on our lawyers, where you can go to find all of those results. On the right hand side is the latest member of our chip family, which is our E5 4600 family. This is a set of chips that we announced uh, in March and then enhanced with a four socket version um, just recently, I think at the beginning of June. It is aimed at a little bit of a different place um, in the, the product line. It's really optimized for density. This is the chip that we do to put in all of the blade servers that all of our partners build, whether they're Dell or IBM or HP. It allows you to pack the maximum number of processors in there. So it will not be the absolute highest performance, but it's generally the best performance per watt. Because what people are trying to do, whether, whether they're rack space or their internet data centers or the, the big OEMs, is really hit a performance per watt space that allows them to build these very large systems with the maximum number of processors. They're density optimized. They give you the control over the power so that if you are really looking to increase the computes but not increase your power envelope, there are some price points and choices you can make, and they're cost optimized. Last but not least, with this generation of products, for those of you who may not consider yourselves high performance computing, but maybe you're crunching a lot of data and analytics, these boxes have up to 70% performance improvement on floating point. We have added a whole next generation of advanced vector instructions for people who do a lot of vector processing, and they are our highest performance product in that space today. We will be waterfalling those improvements into follow-on generations, um, but obviously if you're, you're looking for analytics performance or technical computing performance, that's the chip that you want to use. Now how does this all happen? Where do these chips come from? I want to talk a couple minutes about it because just as we're at some inflection points um, in the industry for software, for data, for the solutions that people are providing, silicon evolution has become a very expensive business. Um, I'm an old person and I can talk to Paul Cormier and other guys here. We used to work at DEC long ago and far away. And in those days, you could build a fab for a couple hundred million dollars. And I say that like, you know, I have it in my pocket, but you know, $250 million, you could have a fab. In fact, DEC built one out in Hudson and it's still out there. Intel's uh, acquired it and continued to improve it. But you have got to invest in the lab to continue this technology drive. For a long time, people thought that we would never get down to these kinds of densities, that you'd never get under a micron, let alone to 45 or 32 or 22. Intel pioneered a technology called high K metal gate in 2007 with enhancements in 2009 that let us get to 45 and 32 nanometers. It gave us virtually a three and a half year lead over the industry. The entire industry right now has pretty much flipped over to high K metal gates to drive the density and the performance they need. But of course, we have to continue to keep investing and in our latest technology, which we announced last year, is essentially our Trigate technology. And what's important about Trigate is two things. It's a three-dimensional technology, so it now allows you to take advantage of vertical space to continue to scale the number of devices that you can get onto a small piece of silicon. 
But more importantly, one of the benefits of the Trigate technology is that it really lowers your power. So you can see from the slide that you can get a 37% performance gain still at relatively low voltages, or if you're one of the internet data centers and what you're really worried about is I've only got so much power in this building, is that you can get a 50% power reduction at constant performance. Now think about that, because if it's a 50% power reduction at constant performance, you can put more servers in that same building for the power that you've got. And if what you're running is web serving, it's not going to demand the cycles at the highest end of our line that might demand more power. So we are acutely aware of the fact that people need the amount of performance and the amount of power that it takes to deliver their workload but maybe in some cases not any more than that. That a high performance computing load or a database or an analytics load is different from a web serving app tier. And so we have delivered our first version of these 22 nanometer parts. We're very proud to have them rolling off the line right now. And that's half of the equation of what it takes to succeed in this business. The next part of what it takes to succeed is the volumes that it takes to make these investments. Because if you go back to when DEC could build a fab for $250 million, you know, maybe you had to do billion, two billion in fab parts to make that pay off. You put them in systems, you recovered your ROI. At the billions, billions of dollars it takes to invest in a fab today, our best ROI models say that it takes between nine and $12 billion of chips to recover that cost. Now, as hard as it might be to make money selling open source software, <laughs> when you're selling those chips for a wide variety of prices, all of which are really usually in three digits, that's a lot of chips, which is why Intel is competing in our new Ultrabook category, why we have just announced phones in India and China and the UK, why we are looking at different ways of delivering system on a chip technology, our new Atom technology, which is a low power technology, because we need the volumes to keep the fabs full. And as I always say to people, I'm from that really tiny small part of Intel called servers, because servers in their best year will never be more than 5% of Intel's volume. We can be outrageously successful, but people just aren't buying servers at the same rate that they're buying cell phones, tablets, laptops, all of the consumer gear that's out there. So we think that there is going to be a tipping point that's coming in this, in this business where you are going to see a large number of suppliers who are at the bottom of that list really no longer be able to afford to run fabs, that you're going to see more consolidation, that you're going to see more partnerships, that you're going to see more companies become fabless and outsource the actual building of their technology. But it also means that we believe that Intel and a few others like Samsung, who are the next bar down on that chart, um, are the ones that are going to continue to be able to drive the next generation of technology, whether it's non-volatile RAM technology, whether it's processor technology, whether it's DRAM technology. And we're concerned, I think, about whether that's going to be good for the business or not, because we still need people doing designs, we still need people actively contributing. Um, you know, there's a who's who of players on there of people who have led and demonstrated technology, but we also believe that it's the guys at the top who are going to continue to be driving new transistor types, new fabrication types, new generations of non-volatile RAM, higher performance processors. We have all been spoiled, and you say, why should you actually care about that? Well, because you get up every morning secure in the knowledge that Intel is going to produce a part that is higher performance, lower cost, every 18 months. <laughs> and we've all been, you know, lured into believing that the cost of computing just doesn't go up, it just keeps coming down and you get more for your money. This is what's behind that. And the day it stops working and the day you have healthy competition is the day that we actually may wake up one morning to find out that, you know, we've got to pay more for this. I think it was Bill Gates years ago who said that if the automotive industry had had the same price performance leaps that semiconductors had, you'd now be able to buy a car for $200. That hasn't happened anytime soon, but imagine what would happen if the cost of chips started escalating at the same rate of inflation that other things in our economy do. 
So Intel is very committed to continue to use its volume economics to drive inf innovation because we think that that foundation of open computing, open computing platforms, uh, the ability to put parallel configurations together to drive those computes into storage now, into networking now, or what is key to allowing the open source environment to continue to grow and exploit Moore's law and to provide the solutions that really only open source can provide. So this looks fairly familiar to my first sled. And this is a challenge to us, to Red Hat, and to all of you in this room, which is now that you've passed a billion, you need a new goal, you know? You can't kind of settle back and not say you don't have one. So we want to come back here and see when you've got to five billion. You've got all these great new product lines. You're doing storage now. You're doing cloud. You're doing virtualization. You've got JBoss. So I'm sure your CEO has got a goal for when you hit five billion, and I'm sure that he's going to come back next year and say, we've got to do it faster, because that's what you pay CEOs to do. So we just want to say we're here. We're here to be your partner. We're here to help drive this explosion in data and the kind of growth we think it can contribute. Sells chips for us, sells licenses for you, sells support contracts, sells storage. I mean, if big data is going to do anything, it's going to sell a boatload of storage. Of that, we can all be secure. So we congratulate Red Hat, and we look forward to the next major milestone that we can accomplish together. So thank you for your time this morning. And I think we've got uh, a little video which shows you what it takes to build and operate a fab, which we've sped up to breakneck speed, and I think is kind of cute. So it's the most about fabrication facilities you're ever going to learn in a couple minutes. <laughs>